Hello and welcome to Semen. I'm Francesca Gavin, the contributing editor at Semen. And for some unknown reason, you don't know what Semen is, you can find out all you need to know and meet some of the world's most colourful cultural influences while you're at it on www.semen.com. That's like Semen, like week in French. So today we are very lucky to be joined by Anna Bruberg and Oliver Shannara. How are you both? Hello. Thank Good. you. Good. <laughs> How has your Semen been, your week? No. Have you had a good week? Uh, it's been interesting, yeah. Uh, I've been in Berlin, The Hague, Amsterdam, and now London. So I don't know where I woke up this morning, but it seems and to be London. And I've been in the London Underground at kind of three in the morning installing our new work. Well, it's right. kind of amazing. So I've, just for those that don't know, you're a collaborative duo, and you're not actually based in the same city at this moment in time. Do you want to say, firstly, like to go back to a little bit to the beginning of how you met and what you find interesting about working together? Uh, well, we met in a tiny town in South Africa where I spent my first 20 years and Ollie spent his first seven years. Uh, we were both on holiday and our collaboration started as out of a friendship and kind of organically grew into a practice. How old were you both at the time? He was 20 and I was seven. Oh. <laughs> it's a form of paedophilia. Um, we, we really started working together at Colours magazine, uh-huh. which was the Benetton magazine in Italy. Um, and we edited that for three years. And that's re- that was really our photography school. Wow, where amazing. We really learnt about taking pictures and also using pictures, other people's pictures. And um, I think that's where we started developing an interest in the relationship between pictures and words and the way they intersect on the page and a kind of love of bookmaking. And I think that all stems from that, those early days. Actually, it's quite fascinating because if you look at a lot of your projects, let's say the Holy Bible, where you took the Bible and you layered imagery on top of the text, almost illustrating it in some tangential sense I could totally see how that could connect to what colours did in terms of looking at those kind of big issues we phrase mm. it that way mm. and kind of things that were quite bold and mm. would you see a connection between those things yeah I mean um, quite a crude one and if you look at colours now while it was revolutionary in the 90s it's almost it's it's the language of kind of advertising today you know so there's nothing kind of um, challenging about it but um, I think we'd I mean, I think we owe Olivero Toscani more credit than we probably give him for, um, first of all, getting us excited about photography, but also, I mean, there's a real crude kind of politics in the work that we do, um, which I think is absent in a lot of contemporary art. Um, and I think we learnt a lot of that through working with Olivero. Yeah, and also his kind of uh, lack of respect for anything that moves <laughs> <laughs> I think we absorbed a, a healthy but not unhealthy amount of that you know our, our, our subject matter like the film that's currently showing in King's Cross is about the idea of migration and it looks at particularly the migrant route between Libya and uh, the southern tip of, of Europe so Sicily and um, so we took a trip on, um, on a boat to the coast of Libya 10 miles off where they rescue the migrants who are in these kind of rubber dinghies that are not seaworthy for more than you know five minutes. Um, and within half an hour, I had rescued kind of 600 people, and then it's a 48-hour journey back. But equally, um, I have a little house that's 15 minutes away from the, the port where these boats land called Pozzalo, and we encountered 400 of these uh, boats, the wow. kind of North African boats that were all deemed to be destroyed. So we got permission to film the destruction of these boats. The, 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 the interesting thing is that people come to Europe on these boats and they're taken into the asylum system and often sent back or you know, leak <coughs> into Europe somehow. But the boats themselves never go back. And they've been sitting there and accumulating. And as Adam was saying, um, it actually became a practical problem. There just wasn't any space for these boats. And when we encountered them, we were just struck by how beautiful they were. You know, these wooden boats, very old, some of them. Um, all of them painted, hand-painted, often with iconography, eye, eyes and birds and feathers and just really beautiful detail. And when you look at them, 
you think about African masks, for example, these kind of objects that sit in museums and are actually really precious. And it struck us that these boats were not just vessels, but they were actually bringing culture as well with them. Um, and we felt our initial instinct was to actually try to save one of the boats. And we did propose to bring it back to the UK and actually put it into King's Cross and have it sitting there in the um, middle of the station. That's a crazy idea. Well, we, uh, uh, we, we, we got permission. We, it was all lined up and we decided it wasn't the right approach and it needed, it needed more an abstract approach. And so we decided we needed a, a guide. We needed a kind of main character. And the main character we chose was um, this machine, this Italian machine that was uh, sent by the Italian state to destroy these boats. And um, she's also a canta storia, which in, in Sicilian tradition means a singer, storyteller, essentially. And she, the song she sings is from the 40s, and it sings about um, all the men having to leave Sicily and go to America, um, and the pain of having to leave your homeland. And so what she's actually doing is taking what we call this current crisis of migration and expanding its biography, because... The island of Sicily has experienced the pain of losing people, you know, for the same reason people are coming from from southern Sudan to 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 southern Europe. The Sicilian same, the same reasons, America. exactly. And, mm. and I think one thing that struck me was coming on the boat back from Libya to Sicily was that in the 30s, my grandparents took the boat from Eastern Europe to Africa, because I grew up in South Africa, um, so the opposite direction for the same reason to to is for the to escape you know Survival. Nazis. yeah um can we just for those people who wouldn't know because not everyone knows can you describe a little bit what art in the underground is because it's a kind of incredible project and the way you've manifested it I mean this is essentially taking art and putting it into public space and very very like general public space it's not a normal art audience no and that's, that's what's so interesting about it you're presenting art in a non-art environment and people are people who wouldn't normally encounter art are encountering it on their journeys home or journeys to work but it's it's a real challenge for an artist because you're trying to make a work you know a work by its definition grabs your attention and takes your time and makes you think about something or contemplate or even if it's just to enjoy the physical beauty of something um, there is a there's an engagement there and what's difficult about the underground is the whole architecture of the underground is designed to have people move in um, and it's there's literally no space for people to congregate that would be considered dangerous or a threat and so th this whole system is designed to kind of funnel you in and funnel you out and in fact we had an interview with one of the controllers of the London underground and he described it as that their aim was to create a completely unmemorable experience, which was, is a really beautiful phrase. It was this idea that you come in, you travel through the system and you leave, and, you, and you're almost unconscious. And so the idea of putting a piece of art into that environment seemed contradictory. And, and we really desperately wanted to make something that felt like an obstacle, that would stop people and wake them up a little bit in a way and I don't know if we achieved that well I think what's partly beautiful about the work is seeing people who don't engage it so it's in the epicenter you know it's literally in the, mo the busiest part of the London Underground in King's Cross and what's what I found quite poetic was the people who ignore it and pass under it because it's kind of in a metaphoric way it talks about how we ignore these issues but also um occasionally there would be somebody would just stop and suddenly engage i mean yesterday i was standing there and somebody stopped who was obviously sicilian and started singing the, the song the rosa balisteri song and she was like oh my god the song's playing in the middle of king's cross and for her the music um rather than the imagery uh, kind of uh, uh you know did what ali said it kind of interrupted her the normal journey you know but it, it also attests to how kind of inured we are to input because you like you get into the zone and you watch people and they're just like they it's almost like horses with the, with blinkers on you know what I mean in order to survive you have to 
close off or, or like all manner of uh, intake, you know what I mean? I think, I mean, there could be somebody bleeding to death while being raped on that screen and many people wouldn't even notice. I mean, it's, it's insane the degree to which we're able to screen out screens in a way. But Can we talk about the politics for a minute? Because I find it quite, obviously your work has become, has always had an element of politics. You did some really interesting projects with the archive of the Troubles in Northern Ireland. And I think around Brexit, you're probably one of the most vocal artists, alongside Wolfgang mm -hmm. Tillman's perhaps, with projects that are in particular the amazing Baby It's Cold Outside t-shirt that kind of went viral. Um, do you want to tell me where that, what you like, A, about making poetic, artistic, political works that are reaching an audience in different ways that aren't necessarily the most obvious? Because it seems to be like you make things with an art context that are political, but also totally different. Like a t-shirt. Mm. It's interesting to think about the t-shirt as whether that's part of our practice mm -hmm. or whether that's a kind of form of, of um, activism in a way. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's, you know, there's activism on one side, there's making art on the other, and they do connect. And where you draw that line is very particular. They do connect. I think the danger of it being part of a practice is that it's seen as a work and just as a work then it's seen as a Brumberg and Chanarin and it's not actually about the message and the message is actually more important and I think that um, in a way in a way we don't have one strategy we deal with each issue uh, in, in a different way according to what that issue needs to be dealt with you know so there's no one signature style to us so it doesn't get subsumed by a kind of um, a brand or a look or do you understand what I mean mm -hmm. and I, I think, think it's significant that we didn't go to art school um, because we our work is not that inward looking in terms of the art world it's more outward looking in terms of the world we come from a documentary background for documentary photography and we never worked in a studio from the first 10 years of our practice. We were always out. It was always about an engagement with the world. And, and I suppose that we're more interested in what's out there than what's inside our own heads. Mm. And we also come from South Africa. And we also both, I mean, recently discovered we're cousins, but we're Eastern European Jewish. So I think combine all of those factors, genetic, you know, geographic and... and um, and like Ollie said, our kind of our just our curiosity about the world. I think that leads to the practice, but it's not. Um, it's never been trained in a professional or honed in a professional way, you know. So um, I mean, that we're makes quite, we're quite un undisciplined in a way, you know. Um, and how did you just discover you were cousins after working <laughs> together for twenty years? Oh, uh, it was it was through Adam's mother. I think found a family tree, and I'm on it. No, by some distant relative. Oh, yeah, that's so amazing. Pretty bizarre, yeah. How incredible! But um, as we've said before, we you know we come from this puddle of a gene pool. Which is like, I, know well. I know the puddle well. <laughs> <laughs> I'm distantly well. connected to your puddle. <laughs> yeah, I'll put it that way. Um, do but, you want to tell me a little bit? Because obviously, Adam, you're based in Berlin. Oliver, mm. you're based in London. How are you? How does your process work? Because I'm really curious. Because not only are you engaged, you're physically mm. in different places. How mm. do you actually make it happen? That's quite a new thing, because for 20 years we've been in the same place. But I'd say that our practice has changed over the years many, many times. I mean, we started off, you know, in our early 20s, we would, uh, in the space of three years, I think we visited about 24 countries, from a psychiatric hospital in Cuba to a maximum security prison in South Africa to a space station in Moscow, and... Um, those were the days when we had no responsibilities, no restrictions. You know, I think me having children brought in a change. Then Ollie getting his dog brought in a radical change. I mean, yeah, I Otto, practiced, I think, uh, Otto, changed everything. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 In fact, Otto's really the engine behind our practice. He's, he's the author. <laughs> he's the brain. We often talk about the fact that because we're two, there is no author. There's a kind of anonymous creator, but actually it's Otto. Well, Otto's <laughs> exceptionally cute dog wiggling around as we speak. But I mean, but, yeah, but, but th this thing of being actually in two cities is a new departure, and we're learning to, to navigate that and to... And to 
enjoy the liberty that that offers and to also how to get over the obstacles that we encounter you know so again it's just i um, think you know there are lots of other artist duos and probably all duos find their own way of keeping a balance um but the thing that we talk a lot about is the idea of consensus because in as a as a as a couple as a duo you know do we require complete consensus on everything you know, if I like this as a piece of work and Adam likes that as a piece of work, do we have to agree on everything? Mm -hmm. Or can it be a bit more open? You know, and so these, this is the kind of battle that you have when you're two people. And also your work, when you're working with things like archives, I would imagine that's almost like another collaborator being, or do you think, see it more as a, a material rather than like another? I think that's a good point. And we often collaborate with other people or spaces or institutions very often. And I'd say Ollie and I are really good at infiltrating, um, you know, like we've worked with the Israeli Defense Force or the British, the Ministry of Defense, or, and we're good at getting into these places and almost operating as kind of counterintelligence agents. So seducing our way in and then producing something that uh, inverts the kind of... Um, the narrative they were expecting, you know, so it's... Seducing but, intelligence agencies is a really interesting way of phrasing it. <laughs> I think that, you know, we're interested in challenging institutions, but as we become more known for that, it's become harder for us to operate in that way, obviously. Um, so we've had to develop new strategies, and I think that the, the machine that you see in our film, in King's Cross, is another way of critiquing the institution of, of Europe. In a way, she, she is a stand-in for the state. She's literally the me the machinery of the state, and she's there. She's her job is to destroy these boats at the will of the state. Um, but she's also um, having a good time doing it. She's kind of dancing and whistling and singing over the ocean. And there's something macabre about that, and and kind of slightly twisted. So, so I think yeah, I think and that's a great point. The idea of of are we allowed to approach this issue of refugees and migration with a sense of humor and with the notion of abstraction? So it's not just literal, it's not metaphoric, and it's not so worthy or super serious, you know? There's, um, and I think um, that's very important to us, that that comes through. You know? mm. Because we thought about the Mediterranean as this place that we all, we've all been there on holiday. It's like we've all watched Fellini films and, you know drunk Camparis and the, the, you know the, the Mediterranean is a playground but at the same time it's this place where people are disappearing drowning it's in, it's really a conflict zone in a way and it's it's both of those things and I think we wanted to try and capture that particularly in the music that we've very beautiful that music. we had composed mm. for the, um can I ask you do you did is this your first moving image piece because obviously I've seen you do much more photographic still works but I'm just curious and how does it relate to other things no I'd say the, the uh, we've made many um, uh, so when we went to Afghanistan for example we got embedded with the British military and we went there and uh, all we took was a piece of um, unexposed photographic paper but we filmed that box of paper from our studio in East London to the front line in Kabul and all the way back and that's a piece of moving but and our other probably more substantial piece is a piece called rudiments where we uh, worked with young British cadets and again like the machine in the in the bureaucracy of angels we took a buffon a kind of uh, medieval clown who teaches the children to unlearn everything they're learning during the day in a military sense um, so we engage slapstick and humor and and um, and uh, and we did eventually get kicked out of there, like we normally do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you? <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. They eventually catch on. We to always you. get kicked out of everywhere. It makes well you get you, you already have what you need by this point. <laughs> obviously. I think our only real danger is becoming an institution ourselves, and that's something we really need to be aware of because you know, and I think that's what we try to be vigilant about is like not because so many artists. Um, it's interesting, we curated a few years ago a, a f festival, it was called Alias, mm -hmm. and we, what we did is we commissioned about 25 writers to write a fictitious biography for 25 visual artists. So we got Siddhartha Mukherjee, who's a, he is an oncologist who wrote the biography of cancer. 
to write a biography for um, Gabriel for Gabriel, Orozco. Gabriel Orozco. And Gabriel had to literally inhabit that persona for about a month and make work, not as Gabriel, but as this fictitious. And so we had this um, exhibition right across Krakow that had these 25 fictitious biographies. But w most people failed. Most people were unable to break out of their mode of production, you know. Because artists can be very conservative. It's quite interesting that that's almost quite fiction, but because a lot of what you do seems to be playing more with the idea of fact. Let's say, like your text print pieces you do, which I think are really interesting, mm. which you use newspapers and literally print text on top of it. What do you? How does that kind of relate to or contrast to you? What do you like about? I think it's the idea of accidents. I think that's something that we're fascinated by, and that we spoke about authorship, and that because we're two, in a way, you can't really place the authorship, and and accidents and chaos kind of help with that often we try to let the world kind of dictate the way something is made rather than us being necessarily creative about it so with the newspapers there's just wonderful coincidences of the way this the, the statement kind of juxtaposes with the content of the paper of the newspaper and those are all just totally accidental mm -hmm. you couldn't invent it in fact mm -hmm. you'd never come up with that the other thing we do all the time is steal I mean, so, they, uh, you know, our book called War Primer 2, what we did is we got all the last copies of a, of a book called War Primer by Bertolt Brecht. We literally hijacked the book, we silkscreened and pasted into it by hand, and we stole his book and we destroyed it and created something new. And I think uh, a, a lot of our work is, you know, we're stealing quotes and pasting them onto newspaper things there's not much creativity there. It's just a, it, it's a, it's an old surrealist trick of you know. I actually saw the War Primer and the War Primer Two in Stockholm. They're both on show at the moment at the Bonnier Constal. Right. Um, and it was actually fascinating seeing the relationship mm. between the Bertolt Brecht, which were amazing. Yeah. But the, what, what I loved about what you did is you also translated it into English. You kind of updated in a way, and sort of made what his commentary was on, let's say imagery from World War II, a very shocking imagery in a lot of the mm, Bertolt Brecht, mm, really quite surprisingly. Mm, mm, mm. And obviously he's best known as a playwright. Mm. So it's really interesting seeing you come in with a, a different take on how to describe the imagery of war, which was mm. the theme of the show. Mm. Um, they're kind of, it was, yeah, it was fascinating. It really worked. There you go. I want the Bretel Brecht. <laughs> in, the, in the front of that book, we've screen printed a, a quote by Brecht, which was, don't start with the good old things, with the bad new ones. And, and we, we put that there because we started that project um, by, in a way, copying Brecht with cutting out pieces of newspaper and trying to write poems in a similar sort of way. And it was, didn't work at all. And then we realized that if Brecht had been alive today, he wouldn't be looking at newspapers. He'd be looking at YouTube. He'd be looking at, you know, video, basically. Um, so all of the images that we put into the, into the book are all screen grabs. And that felt like, a, you know, it, it felt too nostalgic to be going through newspapers with a pair of scissors. Is the internet something that you feel is impacting on your work a lot? I mean, obviously, this is a screen-based piece you have at the moment at King's Cross. But also, do you find technology is coming into you? What's interesting is that War Primer book feels quite dated now, in a way. It feels quite old-fashioned to be mining the internet and sticking them into a book. Absolutely. And I mean, yeah. we... Um, you know, we teach a lot. So we're professors in Hamburg at the art school there, and... It's interesting to see a new generation who, um, who occupy the digital world in a very different way to the way that we relate to it, you know, literally, like uh, both on a physical and a kind of psychological level. Um, well, sadly, I think we're coming to a close, but as a last question, I'm going to ask you how you're going to survive the semen ahead, that being the week of freeze. Um, what are you both doing? And what are you We're both doing? leaving town. Really? Well, yeah. you, know, um, you know John Baldessari's famous quote? He Very said, rich. Um, an artist going to an art fair is like listening to your parents fucking, so you should just never do it. <laughs> so we're taking his advice. And we, we're doing a lecture at Yale, actually, on the day of the opening. I so. think that is a very nice alternative excuse. Sorry, we're far too intellectual. So basically, <laughs> your advice is to survive freeze, don't go. And occasionally lecture at Yale, which is much better. Um, well, thank you very much. Be sure to check out the Bureaucracy of Angels, which is part of Art in the Underground at King's Cross, right outside the Hammersmith and City Line entrance. 
on you until November the 25th. Thank you both very, very much. Thank, Thank you. you.